that's what my dad called me from a very young age. So oh, I think I was destined to do this work. Not only was I destined, but I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Chicago. So coming to Michigan, kind of, even though I've never been here, feels like home. I kind of get the principles of how you live and, you know, the foundations of family and how important that is. And I would say that really it's because of my family that I'm even here talking today. When I was growing up in the 1970s, much like Logan's mom, probably, I had a mom who was, she really broke the mold. And I would say that, you know, during that day of the 1970s, it wasn't cool to be into health. In fact, you were a self-proclaimed health nut if you were into anything food related. And so my mom got into her food and into her faith. She was pregnant with my brother. I was about eight or nine years old. And up until that time, I was eating Oreos. I could have Pop-Tarts. I was having all kinds of different processed carbohydrates that were really nice and sugary and sweet and inflammatory. And I loved them. But when my mom went through this revelation that she had when she was pregnant for the third time, my world turned upside down. And so I had to go to school with brown bread sandwiches instead of Wonder Bread, which, you know, that was a day of Wonder Bread, right? Chip and jelly. And so I now had to go to school with homemade bread and Del Davis. Does anybody remember Del? Do you remember Del Davis? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nutrition pioneer. Yes. I mean, my mom was reading a Del Davis book. She had me reading food labels when I was nine. I knew what mono and diglycerides were. <laughs> and I, you know what? I didn't think it was cool. I hated it. And I was really mad at my mom. And I was, I was the emotional kid. So I'd come home from school crying because the kids would make fun of my sandwiches. And I felt like an outcast. I'd go to Girl Scouts, and I'd have to bring my own food. I couldn't do the Kool-Aid. I couldn't do the s'mores. I'd have to have my own jug of water and like fruits and vegetables. And so my sister didn't mind, but I was really mad. I was inflamed, actually. <laughs> and so I'd come home from school crying, and my mom would just wag her finger at me, and she would just say, Deanna, you can just tell those kids at school, the whiter the bread, the quicker they're dead. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And so it was very hard for me. And, and I must tell you, this drove me into secret of eating. The moment I could get a job, at the age of 12, I had a newspaper route. So I'd go and deliver newspapers with my sister, my younger sister, and I'd take that money and I'd go and spend it in secret at the candy store. And I started binging. I started eating in secret. I began eating chocolate, lots of sugar. Oh, and I didn't mention my dad was a Chicago police officer, and I went to Catholic school. So I had restriction upon restriction upon restriction. And so I was just, yeah, you know, there was a piece of this that led me into a disordered eating path. So I want to be real with you about that because we look at food and eating in a really cool way now. You know, I live on the West Coast. I live in Seattle. And there is part of the culture. If you're not eating well, it's like, what's wrong with you? You know, it's almost like you are the nut for not eating well. So when I look back at all those days and I look at my, my trials and tribulations through food and eating, it was a rocky path. It really was. But through food and through eating, it was like I developed in a personal way. Like it led me down a spiritual path. And I'm really glad that I had that tumultuous beginning with my mom and with food because it led me to really feeling passionate about it. She's very connected into food still. She still lives in Chicago. I just visited them before I came here. From a different point of view, I'm interested in it from a cosmic, from a spiritual, from a, a mental, emotional point of view that how we eat is how we live and how we live is how we eat. You know, it's, it's so, I, I can see it for myself. And I didn't mention this, but I did develop all kinds of conditions because of my addiction to sugar, all of my binging. So I got endometriosis, which is an inflammatory condition of the uterus. I got irritable bowel syndrome, and this all happened in high school. And I went in the underground of like, okay, I was the nerdy scientist, and I was going to figure myself out. We didn't have the internet back then, so I'd have to go to the library and pour over books and try to figure out what's going on. And of course, I'm not going to see anything around food because that was what I was polarized and emotionally against. But that was part of the, the solution for me. And so I would say fire, inflammation, is actually my friend. It's my teacher because I developed so much inflammation, especially in my gut. And I used food in the long run to help heal myself. But I also 
also used something else. So it wasn't only food. And I never want to give the idea that food is the ultimate and the only medicine, because I don't think it is. So what I'm going to talk about today is not just food and inflammation, but also lifestyle. Because of how you eat is how you live. We need to be looking at how we're living. And one of the things that helped to heal me was painting. You know, big, crazy, monstrous kinds of paintings that were really vividly colored. And so it wasn't just a brain type of healing where I thought through everything. It was like an intuitive healing. And so I want to encourage you in this space this morning to come into that place with me because it's not something that everybody feels comfortable with, right? <clears throat> we just want the recipe. We just want to be told what to eat every day. We don't really want to have to kind of get into the mucky muck of, gosh, what is my body really telling me that I need right now? But those are really important questions that we need to get into, and that's where the real healing takes place. I think the, the whole sphere of food and how we enter into that, because I am going to talk about the different foods and how they create inflammation, that's a reality. There's science on that. And then you have to go further and say, well, what am I inflamed about in my life? Where am I irritated? Where am I reactive? Because all of those things go together. And I know that so many of you are of the holistic mindset. And so that's what we're going to talk about as it relates to inflammation today. We are truly, um, you know, it's kind of interesting because I didn't even know that I'd be giving this talk on this day. But every year I set an intention. And I thought for this year, my intention is to focus on the fire element. All things fire. I like heat. I don't like cold, which is why I, I might have an issue living in Upper Michigan. <laughs> I love the heat. I've got lots of fire around me. I mean, I just love the element of fire, but I feel like it's out of balance. And so how do we create better balance with fire? Because fire can be beautiful. It can spark us. It can inspire us. You know, what is the bonfire that lives within us? Is it a raging fire that's out of control where we have inflammation and chronic disease? Or are we putting out, are we burning out? You know, because we have so much fire, now we're crisp. And we're kind of uh, to this point that we can't recover. We've got compassion fatigue. You know, we have workaholism, perfectionism, overjudgment. These things wear away at our vital force. So we'll talk about all of that stuff. And uh, I definitely want to take questions and hear from you too as we go. <clears throat> So fighting fire with, and by the way, this is not my title. I think, Roger, you had this idea that I should give this talk. And in part, it was because I was on the cover of Spirituality and Health in May, kind of serendipitously, and uh, a man had seen me give a talk, and he said, I think you need to write an article about food, and I want you to call it Fight Fire with Food, and <laughs> How to Stop Inner Climate Change. So uh, this is not my title, but I really like it because I feel like he was really on to something. Uh, in terms of looking at how we are essentially the sum of our planet, right? And the planet is us. There's no separation between what's out there and what's in here. And so how do we look at fire in a very earthy, sustainable, you know, just really looking at our environment? And I'm so passionate about not just food, but what we're doing to the environment in terms of toxins. So most of the time I'm lecturing on heavy metals and plastics and phthalates and parabens and all the junk that comes along for the ride in food. In fact, on the uh, plane from Chicago to Traverse City, I'm sitting next to a man, and uh, you know he gets served his, his water, and then he says to me, this is the first thing he says to me the whole time that we were on the flight, he goes, you know, I just love this Dasani water. It just tastes so clean. And I said to him, um, really? And, 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 and then he said, yeah, you know, it's so good that I buy cases of it at home. So then I'm going into education mode. I'm like, well, do, doesn't the plastic bother you, all those plastic bottles? And he says, no, not at all. It, you know, it just makes for a clean taste. I said, but what about the planet? You know, you may like it, but what about the planet? You know, these plastics are everywhere, and they're changing up your, you know, endocrine system, and they're, they're pro-cancer. And, you know, I start, like, getting really passionate about this. And he says, you know, you're right. Coke does taste better than glass oh. bottle. <laughs> Uh, 
of, you have it as your, your quote, don't you, Michelle? Right? This is a revolutionary act. Every meal that we have, this is Wendell Berry? Yeah. Yes, the, the whole idea that every meal you have is connected to a lineage, right? You are selecting from something that has some type of lineage through the environment. And so what are you choosing each time? So maybe you like the taste of something and it's good to indulge in it, but longer term, where is that taking all of us? So I just thought it was very perfect that I was on the plane with somebody who gave me a window into the idea that not everybody thinks like us. And how do we get that word out in compassionate ways? How do we help to educate people? You know, I just posted on my Facebook about the toxins in tea bags. Tea bags, and we've always, I'm sure you've known this intuitively, right? You see the, the, the mesh bags, you see the paper bags with the adhesives or <clears throat> with the staple and then that sits in hot water. Yeah. But now we know that there are thousands and thousands of, it's actually been quantified how many microplastics are liberated from a tea bag. So this can send us down the rabbit hole of inflammation. We don't want that either, right? It's almost like how do we maintain the balance of knowing this information, but not letting ourselves get too riled up about that kind of stuff because that, it's good to have a little bit of anger but we can't let it turn into rage because then we'll just embody that. So uh, somebody, where is she? Yes, she had asked me in my tapas talk uh, about whether or not I was going to talk about traditional, non-traditional medicine. So here we go, I am. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of wisdom in older systems of medicine. So even though I lecture for the Institute for Functional Medicine, I think the functional medicine is basically ancient medicine that has been reworded and returned with different language. Because my husband looks at the functional medicine matrix, he's like, yeah, this is just Chinese medicine with different language, you know? We are reinventing the Eastern way of thought into the Western way of thinking and using science now. And we are now seeing that the Ayurvedic doshas, the constitutional types, have certain genomic patterns that jive with those doshas. So it's so beautiful to see how science and spirit East and West, traditional medicine, current medicine, are all, we're in this place of convergence. And sometimes there has to be a little bit of fire to make that transformation happen. And I think that that's what's happening at a very symbolic level. So yes, um, the, the place that I think we probably feel some of these four elements coming through, especially the fire, is in the realm of stress. We were talking about stress at breakfast and how important the simple breath is you know, to bring us back into our belly, breathing through the belly. Um, but stress is truly an epidemic. And in fact, when the word stress was coined in 1936 by Hans Selye, there was nothing negative about it. It was just basically the body's nonspecific response to change. But now we have lots of change, <laughs> lots of demands. The body just keeps piling up and we start to create this response. So there's a great website, it's called stress.org, easy to remember, and they have a lot of stress research on there, it's the American Psychological Association. And they do different surveys, and essentially what they showed, the last one they did was in 2014, this one was just in 2017, which is very relevant, you look at these five top factors of stress, usually these are things that threaten our survival, threaten our safety, and so every day, I don't know if you feel it, and I'm trying to think if there's any other time in history that I've lived where I've felt such heightened stress societally, you know, people languaging things, whether it's social media or, you know, people are just speaking out their, their rage a bit more. And so do you feel that? I mean, I'm seeing some head nods, so you kind of get what I'm saying. Like, and there's no separation between us as an individual and us as a larger collective or a society, right? So we are all sharing in that same energy. So how do we experience it? Think for yourself right now. Where does stress live in your body? You know, I had a client years ago who said to me in the, um, uh, in the treatment room, at the clinic I was working at, she said, you know, Deanna, it's like illness is the Western form of meditation. So when she got sick with cancer, it was like it forced her to slow down. And she what she had not slowed down. She was busy, busy, busy. You know, we are human doings more than human beings. We really are always doing, doing, doing. And me, the way that I grew up, and you tell me if this is like this for you, but it was all like your value was connected to what you did. You know, you got good grades in school. Um, you know, 
I, I was telling Coco and Roger, I said, you know, me being from the Midwest, I have the disease to please. You know, so it was like expectations, you know, going to Catholic school, like making sure everybody's happy. Um, it just creates a lot of stress within. It's almost like you have to kind of burn that down and reinvent and say, what do I really stand for? What are my beliefs? How do I need to speak my truth? Because otherwise, this stress just kind of builds inside if it's not really connected to truly who you are. So in your body, think of your body as your best friend. It's not against you. Your body is for you. So when people's backs go out or um, you know their vision gets fuzzy, they have a, um, a breakout, you know, their skin gets irritated, their, their gut starts acting up, and they're like, oh, my gut again. It's like, no, your gut. You know, like, that's like your best friend letting you know that something's going on, something's awry, something, there's a disconnect here. It's like, pay attention. Body is messenger, right? Just like emotions, energy, emotion. What is the energy? What is the emotion that needs to be felt? So noting, in your, and I have a list. I'm going to give you a little checklist to see if fire is in balance in your bodies. But based on this, I bet you know for yourself whether or not stress is starting to chisel away at kind of your core essence, your core being, right? It could be something as simple as like you're breathing very shallowly. You know, any of these pain, we'll talk about the hallmarks of inflammation. And then in the mind, for most people, it's not yet in their body, it's still up in their mind. And so they have got monkey mind, right? They can't get to sleep at night, they're full of worry. I often find it really interesting because I deal with a lot of like pseudo healthy people, like very orthorexic, very, um, you know, they're so obsessed with being healthy and eating well that it's almost like it takes another form of worry and it starts to infiltrate into their mind. It's almost like they haven't read their thought label like their food label and they still have toxic thoughts, they still have negative thinking while they're eating a beautiful plate of salad, you know, so it's like there's a disconnect here. What about the whole self? Like what's in your mind is what you're digesting just like this plate of food. So we bring in a lot of that stress through all these different types of emotions, right? And I would say that all of this really in some way embodies inflammation. So any chronic diseases these days, type 2 diabetes, cancer, heart disease, you name it, whatever it is, there is this underlying inflammation. And so really looking at, there's this term out there called symbolic disease. What is the symbolism of what you have? What is that disease or that symptom or that little body sign? What is it teaching you? And really going deeply into that and asking it. Because otherwise, the inflammation just continues to rise. You never get at the root cause. And I always like to ask, like, the five whys. Why? Okay, why? 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 You know, you keep going down. Like, because otherwise, you're just patching it. You're not really getting into, like, the guts of something and why you have it. And I think that people really want to hear that. So as I mentioned, I mean, this is pretty well known now. I mean, Harvard is talking about inflammation as the bedrock of disease. Any chronic disease, you know, you could shout it out. Anything. I guess if you have a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So it's like, you know, infections or, you know, I think about dental issues. We had a great conversation the other day about dental issues, infections, latent infections. We all, in some way, I think, have inflammation going on within us. And if you want to read more, I would say that there's more now even in the popular press. I just happened to stumble upon this um, Harvard Magazine article. This is a really good article. Any of you read this? Yeah, uh, you might just want to, if, if you're interested in it, just Google it. It just came out this year. Could inflammation be the cause of myriad chronic conditions, raw and red hot? A lot of beautiful art in this as well. Um, and it does go into the current thinking. Even mainstream has, has really seen that cardiovascular disease is no longer an issue of high cholesterol. It's about inflammation. It's about what your body is doing to the cholesterol. We had kind of a heated discussion yesterday um, about inflammation uh, as, as being part of heart disease, right? And so to your question about non-traditional medicine, I do think that in many systems of medicine, we look at how does inflammation infiltrate the body. Has anybody ever gone to an acupuncturist or a traditional Chinese medicine doc and herbalist like this? Um, so they look more at the, the patient. So feeling the quickening of the pulse to see if there's inflammation in the heart. 
uh, looking at the redness of the tongue, especially the tip of the tongue, which correlates to the heart. Um, they might look at even reddening of the ears after eating. There's some of that, just looking at the face. Do you have a red face? Um, uh, some people are just more naturally prone to, you know, like I'm Irish, so I've got kind of the Irish skin, right? And so some people are going to be more prone to having more inflammation. It's more apparent in certain body organs. In Ayurveda, this is, uh, you know, you've got three different body types, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. And Pitta is the metabolic type. The f Roger, you're a Pitta, let me say. <laughs> you know, it's robust, you know, it's uh, strong. But that strength can also overtake you in terms of like, you know, all the heat and all the, the reactivity. So, in it, but um, people with strong pitta can have very strong digestion, but it can also be the wound in the vein. It could also be the, the first thing that goes when you're too inflamed or too much of that element. And then in functional medicine, Western medicine, you go to your average doc, and I had a great question yesterday about what are the labs? Like if you go to your doctor, what are you measuring to assess inflammation? And many of these things are kind of researchy and they haven't actually made it to the clinic yet, but then there are basic things like HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. You can get it measured, it won't tell you where it's coming from or the source of the inflammation. So you have to do some deeper digging on that front. But um, you know, just even eating one meal can increase inflammatory cytokines in the blood within four to six meals. Like if you eat something, let's just say you eat brown, yellow, and white foods, nutrient devoid foods, you know, something like a milkshake and a bagel, cream cheese, and sausage. There've actually been studies like this with one meal. One meal can provoke hours of inflammation. And one of the first signs, without even measuring your inflammatory cytokines in your blood, is that you get tired. You feel flu-like, you feel like, I need to go lay down. You shouldn't feel like you need to go lay down after eating. That's like a misnomer, that's like a disconnect if you don't feel energized. After your meal the other night, I swear I couldn't go to bed. I was like, I was just vibrating after all of those plant foods, right? It's just alive. Your food should not make you tired. That's like the antithesis of what it means to eat healthy, right? Your food needs to revitalize you. You might have a little bit of a rest and digest, that's normal. But you should feel so fatigued that you have to go and take a nap after you eat. That to me signifies inflammation. So, um, in, in my true teacher mode, I want to give you a multiple choice question. <laughs> Which of the following is true? Inflammation is the foundation of chronic disease? Yes. Uh, we are eating more pro inflammatory foods? We are. I'm going to get into what those are and give you a list. We are living a more inflamed life. Yes, this one is not a trick question. It really is D. Sometimes I like to do A and B, A and E, you know, just have all, no, this is, it's pretty obvious what we're up against here. And so people will ask me, they're like, well, Deanna, you talk about inflammation, but I don't really know what it looks like. I mean, I think we talk about it very loosely. Whenever you think inflammation, I want you to think of the immune system. They go hand in hand, two eyes. And so if you have a compromised immune system, you get sick all the time, be thinking that your body's inflamed. Your resources, your ability to fight infection is impaired. So think of your immune system. If you have anything that connects to your immunity, think of you having potentially, just over time, inflammation. So it's redness, pain, heat, swelling, and loss of function. And sometimes, again, it's not obvious. You might feel fatigued. Uh, you might just get occasional joint pain, so you might think, oh, I don't have joint pain all the time, so I'm not inflamed. But you could have these things going on within you. And I think it's really important for everybody to have a team of healers where different people into looking at your body, they look at you, they measure you inside, they even track genes. Most audiences, when I ask them, have you had your genes sequenced? They'll say no, and I say, well, how do you know you know, maybe that's like the missing link for you in terms of trying to understand why you keep getting sick with certain things. Maybe you can't detoxify well. So you need certain things to bring into your food in order to do that better, like broccoli. We have a great researcher in the Seattle area. Her name is Dr. Johanna Lampe at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Sometimes people who get cancer, it could be connected into certain genes that they have. So if you understand your genes, you can understand how to work with them through food. And she works with broccoli, 
broccoli and these cancer genes. It's amazing what broccoli can do. And her research showed that steaming broccoli for a minute and 30 seconds, you know, like when it gets really bright green, that's when it optimized the detoxification enzymes. Again, her name is Dr. Johanna Lambie. So we need to see our bodies as all connected, that the fire element is connected to the water element, to the air, to the earth, that it's all connected, right? Um, and so maybe what is happening, we, we hear, whatever your views are on climate change, it's, it, it's, it's important. But what I would say is even more than that, I think what we would all acknowledge is that something is out of balance on the planet. You know, it's not normal to see all these plastics in the ocean and have fish tangled up and all of that. It's not natural to be having all this just plastic everywhere, right? Mercury in the air. I think your levels of mercury here are high, right? Methyl mercury? Yeah, I mean, every area. I, I traveled a lot. I think the only place I have found that is super pure is Iceland. And they eat fish three times a day. <laughs> but they source it from right around Iceland, very, very cold waters. But every place has its own level of dysfunction and imbalance. And Iceland, I'm sure, has something. I haven't found it yet. But most areas, even so, I mean, there have even been microplastics found in Siberia. So in non-populated areas, these things are in our air, they're in our water, they're in our food. Even the best of, you know, Loma, I mean, wherever we're eating from, we can't help it sometimes. These things are so pervasive. So we, we, there's something out of balance on the planet, and that can translate to something out of balance with us. So how do we get things into balance? Because you might be listening to this thinking, oh my gosh. Fear, my heart, my breath is changing, so what do I do? What do you do? You focus on you, because that's all you can do. That is what is within your locus of control, so you focus on making the highest choices you can in every moment. And if you're doing better, you're gonna be making better choices. Those are gonna translate into the planet, into the people around you. You know, there's that ripple effect. There's a great book called Connected by Christakis and Fowler talking about they initially started out studying viral patterns, and then that led them into studying patterns of happiness. And so the people around you, you're going to be affecting through your decisions. This is called sociogenomics, if you want to talk science. You know, the idea that your social communities are changing your behavior. And most of us know that we need to eat better, but we don't know how to get there. 40% of our actions are actually um, automatic. We just do them without thought. And that's probably a very modest number. 40% of our actions are automatic. So the question is, I'm going to ask you this question before you leave today. What is the one thing you want to take with you? What is the one ripple effect that you'd like to see in your life which can translate into the planet? Because it could be something as small as, I will not use single-use plastics anymore. I will get more color in my diet. I will uh, you know, just one small thing. Like even in the county that I live, they ban single-use plastic straws. You know, and then that gets on the news, and then people start thinking, well, plastic straw, maybe I should stop with plastic bags. You know, it starts to create a ripple effect. You don't even realize how one plastic straw, which is why I love those Valerian straws, uh, that how that can have a huge ripple effect. Something so small has a huge level of choice, and that changes our overall planetary climate. So we are the microcosm of the macrocosm, truly. And there is this old adage, as within, so without, as above, so below. Meaning that there's really no division between us and nature. We are nature. And so um, I will also have you reflect on this. You know, what is your relationship to your inner fire? I'm sure you're already thinking about that, right? Um, are you inspired? Or do you feel inflamed? Because I see some people who are very strong advocates for certain things, but then they get beyond the inspiration of it, and they get into the inflammation of it. They embody a lot of anger, a lot of rage, and then there isn't a lot of good outcome. They're just very frustrated. So you want that good, happy balance. So here's, a, for the people in the back, I might have to read a couple of, of these for you, but a person with an imbalanced fire element, and I talk about this in one of my books where I dedicate a whole chapter to fire and the color yellow. So I'm really into color. So each of the colors of the rainbow connect to certain themes. And yellow is this point right here, which is connected to the seat of rotting and ripening, the stomach, the pit of acid and heat. And we need that heat. We just don't want it bubbling over like a cauldron and kind of like inflaming everything else. 
So a person with an imbalanced, so no balance here, there's something off, fire element, has indigestion, burping, or stomach upset that feels like burning, has intolerance or allergies to food, relies on caffeine or in sugar to get stoked, has an accumulation of belly fat suggesting high cortisol, you know, any kind of, um, you know, I'm not against fat, and I, there's no shame here, body shame as, as it relates to fat, but if you do have more fat here close to your organs, this can create inflammation. Fat is not just storage tissue. We now know that it produces like 30 different medical kinds. It's pretty active stuff. And so if you've got it up here on your belly, that could create more inflammation. So take a look at that. Um, are you excessively busy? Some people like to hide their stress by being busy. They think being busy is good. Um, they may be a perfectionist. Any of you in here one of those? <laughs> Reacts quickly to what is not going their way, my way or the highway, you know, book is of control. Overthinks, feels hot or flushed, eats on the run, is a workaholic. Any of you a workaholic by chance? In the Midwest, never. <laughs> Yeah, I think sometimes we tend to bury ourselves in work, right? Has an insatiable drive, ambition, and never says no. I have this thing I just posted on Instagram about, you know how we talk about leaky gut? I think we have leaky heart, cardiologist in our audience. <laughs> I think some of us, we don't talk about leaky heart. We, we hear about leaky brain, we hear about leaky gut. What about leaky heart and all the things that we say yes to when we really need to be saying no? Right, our emotions, our, our feelings, our boundaries. I think all of this, the sum of it, is leaky life. Because again, with the disease to please, you think, I've got to say yes to everything, because I need to be sure that that person is happy and meet those expectations. But each time you do that, you know, it's again, it's starting to chisel away at your reserves. So it's, it's healthy to have boundaries. It's healthy to say no. I think we have pervasive leakiness in our culture. And maybe that's causing some of the inflammation. And I want you to think of leakiness, not just in the body sense, but in the life sense, in a psychological sense. So if you're balanced, you've got great digestion. No issues there. And I love it how when I ask people about their bowel movements, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I had one every other, I have one every other day. You know, it's like, what is people's normal? I had a contractor over our house working on our water system. And we were just talking very uh, casually. And he's like, oh yeah, my wife hasn't had a bowel movement in 30 days. And I literally, I, I did that. I, I said, why do you have to get her to a doctor? And he said, no, she's had scans, there's nothing. And but she's having a hysterectomy tomorrow. She's having her uterus out, right? And I said, you know, leaky gut, everything is leaky in there then, right? Inflammation. So you've got to get your gut working well. Uh, normal blood sugar feels inspired does their best without having to be perfect or the best. That was a hard one for me. But you know, you know, there's that, I'm the oldest, you know, it's like, get the straight A's, do what you can. Now it's like, huh. You know, but it took me to my 40s to kind of get to that point. It's kind of like you have to do a lot of that stuff. Has a healthy appetite, honors her body rhythms of doing and being, and balances work with play. You know, don't forget, as my uncle once said, you know, those who work hard, party hard. You gotta have your party hard place too. Um, maybe not in the traditional sense of what that might mean to some people, but you know, you, you gotta have your place. Some of the best entrepreneurs, they make time to go and play, they go on vacations, they go on retreats. You need that stuff. Some of my best ideas come when I'm doing nothing or nothing. You know, I'm not, I'm not at the computer or working. All right, so what are the solutions? Where do you start to cool off? So what I would say is you pick one of these for yourself. If you feel like writing it down, whatever this, all paths lead into the same thing. It doesn't matter if you work on food or you say, I want to work on my emotions, I want to work on my thoughts. All of it creates a ripple effect. So you figure out for yourself what most speaks to you. But we are going to start with food because that's why we're here to celebrate this weekend, to talk farms, food, and health. And this is where most of your decisions are going to start from every day. Anybody want to guess how many decisions you make every day about food and eating? <laughs> you probably have seen the statistic, right? Anybody just want to shout out a number? Ten. Ten? Seventy-four. Seventy-four? <laughs> Twenty-five. Okay, so they've actually done um, and published research on this in a consumer marketing journal. Um, Two hundred is the average 
200, but we're talking how you eat, with whom you eat, how much you eat, where you eat, and what, what you had to select from. Those are a lot of decisions about food and eating, 200. It's almost like we are consumed more by eating, probably more than we eat. And even when we're not eating, we're actually eating. So if we, when we stop eating, we're still digesting for four to six hours, and then we go and eat again. And then we're still eating for four to six hours. It's like we are always connected in the food. So it's so important to start with that as a foundation. And you know the state of affairs. You've been hearing this for the past day or so, right? We are up against, this is not even the standard American diet anymore. When I went to Australia thinking I'm going to run into like buff, fit, Jason Momoa-like Australians, <laughs> I get there and it's like, no way. It's like they have a greater level of obesity and chronic disease than we do in the States. They're just slightly ahead of the Americans. So it's all over, it's in South Africa, in the UK, all over the place. This is a grocery store uh, that used to be in my neighborhood that is no longer there. This is what I like to do on Saturday nights. My husband thinks I'm crazy. I like to go into the stores and just observe and like look at what are people seeing? I mean, what do you get from this? Nobody's there, first of all. I'm like the only person Saturday night, the weirdo that's in the store taking pictures. <laughs> and I know it's the freezer section, but it's like, is this? Yes, everything is packaged and it's like numbers and I can see plastic, right? <laughs> I just like containers and ugh. Um, this is not like promoting. This can start the, the whole process of inflammation. So if we make 200 decisions about food per day, and we multiply that times 365 days a year times our average lifespan, I mean, truly, the act of eating, even if we were to dedicate our lives to this, this purpose, which some of you are, this is like, you know, this is changing many people's lives and your health just overall. And food is so much. So when I say food is, how would you fill in the blank for you? Just shout it out. Food is? Medicine. Life? Love? I heard love. <coughs> what is it? Creativity. Creativity. Ooh, I have not had that one before. I like that. Fuel. Fuel. Comfort. Comfort. What did you say, Roger? Comfort as well. Yeah, food can be comfort. Yep, it's, help. It, it's, it's all these things, right? The one that I resonate most with here is connection. And I really feel like that's what we're doing here this weekend is we're creating crosstalk. We're creating crosstalk between farms, food, medicine, medical providers. I mean, to think that we have cardiologists, gastroenterologists really being in this space with us to bring and leverage what farms have to offer. And then we have chefs, we have people designing and creating food and getting us excited about it. I just feel like connection, it just feels so good. I feel like we're, we're at that tipping point. But yeah, we've got different things in our food supply than we've had before, and I want you to be aware of that. Because I don't think that there's a lot of talk about toxins here, but for me, it's, it's such a reality, and it's something that I'm really on the pulse of, and I want you to be aware of that and how important organic is, right? How important the container that your food is in it's amazing how much, you know, I go to Trader Joe's. Do you have a Trader Joe's here? Do you know what that is? Yeah. Okay. I mean, everything is in plastic. It's just like, uh, it's just amazing. Like, how, even the produce, you know, just look at what you're buying and, and go the extra effort. I think that the, the cashier always gets upset with me because I'll just pick, like, the loose spinach that's all wet, and I'll just put it on the belt, and then, like, she's got it, and then it messes up, like, her, her checkout belt, and I didn't put it in any plastic. I don't want to buy it in the plastic container. Um, but it's like small things like that that we can do that, that do create that difference. So we are overfed and undernourished. And, and I was having a nice discussion with one of you yesterday who came up to the book signing because, um, you know, talking about weight. Most people, they want to lose weight. It's like that's usually the last thing that I think about. But for most people, it's the first thing. And most people are very frustrated about it. And one of the things I say to them is, look at toxins. Sometimes it's not even the food that you're eating. We now know that the calorie, the whole paradigm of the calorie is outdated. An 80 calorie brownie is not the same as an 80 calorie apple. It's not, you've got different informational signals. Yes, it may have the same amount of energy, but it's not the same in terms of what it's feeding your genes. So be looking at what else is in the food that could be creating the misalignment of signals. And that yes, you know, one meal can increase 
inflammation in the body by up to 100% even six hours after eating that food. So there are numerous studies like this, just single meal studies looking at it. So typically when I think of an inflammatory diet, so this is gonna sound like a Debbie Downer message of like, uh-oh, this is, <laughs> but it's brown, yellow, and white. If you look at most breakfast foods, not what we had today, but most breakfast foods in a hotel or somewhere, brown waffles, toast, bagels, breads, ready to eat cereals, just yogurt. I mean, everything is brown, so where's the color here? Um, high aging, most people care about aging. I'm not really fond of this word anti-aging because I feel like, so what, we're against ourselves from the moment we're born because we're always <laughs> aging, right? That's like the, the course. Um, there's even this word inflammaging. The low level of inflammation that occurs with, um, with aging and can create accelerated aging. This was uh, an example of a menu that was outside one of the hotel rooms that I was staying in. And I know you can't see from the back of the room, but I think you get it. Chicken fried steak and eggs, build your own omelet, you gotta pay extra for spinach. Um, country combo, <laughs> Belgian waffle, tossed it. So it just really shows like how much of the, the brown, yellow, and white that we have. But we can change it. Even if we bring in vegetables, we're actually negating the inflammatory signals. So that's why you're probably thinking, well, Deanna, it's not that I'm never going to have a grilled burger or a grilled something that's brown. Uh, but bring in vegetables because you can essentially nullify, you can mitigate a lot of those inflammatory signals. So the foods, run through these fairly quickly, right? It's not even what you eat, it's how you cook it. So get rid of high heat cooking, any kind of grilling, frying, broiling, anything that you create crisp edges on a food. I mean, look at it, it is inflamed, right? <laughs> In the body, I won't take you through the biochemistry, but there is a receptor for those brown, crisp products and food that just creates inflammation in the body. So these, and you know what, I like it because they're called advanced glycation end products, ages. That ground color to foods when you cook it actually creates aging in the body. It accelerates oxidative stress and inflammatory pathways. So it's really, um, there, was a, there are many of these studies, but this study in particular took one meal, and the meal had a chicken breast, potatoes, carrots, tomatoes, and vegetable oil. So just regardless of the contents of the meal, right? They cooked it in two ways. One was they fried it and or broiled it versus steamed it or boiled it. They found two totally different responses to the meal in type 2 diabetics. So there was oxidative stress in these diabetics when they ate the meal if it was fried versus if it was just steamed. Just by cooking it in a different way created a change in the inflammatory signal. And then, um, I know that this is pretty hard to see, but essentially there are different foods with different levels of advanced glycation end products. The higher the number, the more of those, those brown products. So like bacon, I know Joel Kahn would love this one because bacon is number one. <laughs> bacon is 11,905. Broiled beef frankfurter is number two. Pan fried steak is number three. Okay, so it's gonna sound like, oh, a lot of these meat products, but you know what? You go up to nuts. This is something I'm really passionate about because my PhD was on fats. When you subject fat to heat, light, and oxygen, you create advanced glycation end products. So, Start thinking about your roasted, toasted nut products. Go back to raw and soaked and sprouted. You do that, right, Logan, in terms of your cooking. So, um, because this creates damage, this creates aging in the body. People think that they're doing themselves a really good thing by having nuts and seeds, which they are, but they're eating oxidized fats. Like the very fats that cause atherosclerosis, we're eating them, okay? So these are uh, problematic, so I want you to be about that. The, the rest are pretty intuitive though. The next is about sugar. And this is a real thing. My mom had me keyed into sugar. I remember I wanted sugar when I was young and all my mom would say would go have a date. It's like, I hated those dates. <laughs> and actually they're pretty sugary. I tell my mom now, it's like, you should have had me have those with nuts or something. Cause that was pretty sugary. Um, so anyway, there are many different names of sugar. I want you to read the label. You know, sugar is sugar is sugar. This is something I'm actually really bullish about. I'm more strict about this now in my life because I notice how sugar makes me feel. It inflames me and it creates a more reactive. You know, there was a study, you're not gonna see it in here, but there was a recent study this year, you might find this interesting. Uh, inflammation 
was associated with greater impulsivity. So it's like chicken or the egg. You know, did an impulsive behavior create inflammatory choices or was it inflammation in the body that led to more of a social exhibiting of impulsivity? And usually when we're impulsive, you know, that sugar comes into the picture, right? We, we are low in energy, we need something quick and a fast fix, so we go to something high sugar. But that just creates more inflammation, that creates more reactivity. You see the, the whole schematic there? So read your labels. Um, I do choose certain ones, like I do have honey. <laughs> um, maple syrup, I, I know that it seems like you guys are really keen on maple syrup here, which I think is good. I'm more into honey, quite honestly, because of the immune factors and the different things with bees and supporting them. We live on five acres, and so we have things for the bees. So I like bees. Um, but yeah, you see this, this red peak that goes up and spikes when you eat something sugary. That red is for inflammation. Every time you spike your blood sugar, just think of that as spiking inflammation. Two lines that are in parallel. So really being focused on that. And you know, you know all the high sugar products. But keep in mind that a lot of healthy foods can be high in sugar too. I think people try to justify their sugar habits with certain healthy food products or what they deem as healthy. I was in your food co-op yesterday, and I see a lot of these. I mean, desserts and things that aren't necessarily healthy, but people think because it's at the food co-op, it must be healthy. You know, it's at Trader Joe's, it must be healthy. It's like, no, you still have to read the labels. Poor quality fats is also important. It's really important. And so reading the label, making sure that your, your fats are not toasted or roasted or browned, keep your, um, your fats in dark, Bottles, heat, light, and oxygen, right? It's so important. And make sure you're not getting any trans fat. Read the label for partially hydrogenated oils. And as, in cardiology, as you know, there's nothing. For, I usually don't like to call foods good or bad, but when it comes to trans fats, bad, almost evil. <laughs> not good, uh, very bad for inflammation. I mean, they're toxic fats, they're producer hydrogenation. And so the body doesn't recognize them because they're so synthetic. I would say avoid brown, yellow, and white processed foods as much as you can, and perhaps you'll remember, I don't know where my mom got that phrase from, but uh, I asked her today, and she's like, I don't know, but don't quote me on it. And I, I continue to quote her on it, because I don't know where she got it from. The other one I talked about yesterday briefly is avoid highly allergenic foods, and you have to figure out what you're allergic to. And you might be allergic to things that might be considered healthy, like almonds, or flaxseed, or... Um, I ran a panel, I was allergic to cranberries. So, you know, the least likely foods, you might actually, it might come up for you. Um, my principle here is rotation, rotation. Every three days, make a new food choice. Get your, your gut turns over, your gut lining, you get a new gut lining roughly every week. So make sure that every three to four days, you get new foods. Feed your microbiome with different, different foods here. Uh, I know Coco does a lot of work with, and I'm sure there are other nutrition professionals here, but the elimination diet is many times a great go-to. We're just eliminating a bunch of stuff. You clear a lot of symptomatic noise, and you can see how the body actually responds. Getting rid of coffee, getting rid of eggs, dairy, soy, wheat, gluten, these products. It's amazing how they're in so many different things and people don't realize. Uh, I've already talked a lot about toxins and where they are, um, but again, I think that um, you just try to control what you can. Water is a big deal. You're surrounded with water here, and so um, water is the primary component in our bodies, and so making sure that you have filtered water at home, get your water. There's a great company in Michigan, National Testing Laboratories is the one that I use. They have a water check service, um, so they don't sell a remediation product. They just analyze water, and they do a very complete, um, very inexpensive way to test your water. And avoid being fixated and stressed about food. I know that I'm creating some of that, but um, <laughs> I want you to be have some awareness, right? So here's kind of a summary as far as what would be inflammatory and starting to look at what you can crowd these foods out with, right? And, and having more whole, colorful, plant-based foods. And I don't preach to a certain dietary dogma, right? So if you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, whatever you are, it doesn't matter. I want us to unify as it relates to food and eating, right? You know, all humans need to eat. 
So I often talk about color, creativity, and variety as unifying principles. Color in terms of the pigments, the art of eating as much as those phytonutrients, the creativity, the connection. I was asking Bogan yesterday if he had a cookbook, and he's like, no, that's not, not really my philosophy, right? You know, he, he does his own, like, where it's more intuitive. And if we could be more creative in the kitchen, just think of how healing that could be. Just to play around with flavors and play around with taste and try foods that we haven't tried. I always ask people to try one new food every week. Just one. And then variety. Variety is huge. We had more than 50 plant-based foods in the meal that you made. And usually what I'm aiming for is that people can get 50 unique plant-based foods in seven days. So, and then I'll just quickly close on the anti-inflammatory tips. Let's look at my time here. Okay, great. Okay, so the food. Let me get your quick takeaways on food. Um, just three quick points before I go quickly into the lifestyle. So what, what did you get from that, that whole big issue on, you know, just everything I was saying? What inspired you? What sparked you on certain things? Is there something that, just raise your hand and maybe you can just jot it out. Yes. High heat cooking. High heat cooking is something that you want to pay attention to. Great. And so here's uh, dry hot heat is probably the worst. Slow, low, moist methods. People always ask me about Instapots and crock pots and these things. It's not like I'm completely averse to them, but just look at what you're cooking in because that's a long time and you're taking in whatever that pan, that, that basin is. So if it's aluminum, is it stainless steel, which is high in nickel? Usually stainless steel is okay, but unless you're sensitive to things like nickel and other alloys. So just to be aware of that, get rid of all Teflon. Don't even donate it, just like get rid of it. That stuff is very toxic. Invest in a very good non-toxic cookware. I have a blog on cookware. We did all the, the research on all the different cookware options. So yes, high heat cooking and also pay attention to What's number two? Can somebody else just give me one other thing that they uh, they heard around food? The nuts. What was it? The nuts. The, the nuts. Yeah. Ah, yes. Not to roast. Um, and especially when I see a lot of nuts with oils. You know, it's like, oh, like roasted palm oil or cottonseed oil. Um, yes, thank you for bringing that up around the nuts. And you'll notice that digestion is also better. Yes. What about fruit? What about fruit? Yeah, I haven't really heard you talk too much about fruits versus veggies. Um, I love the plant kingdom, and I do think that people overemphasize fruits relative to veggies. I'd almost like us to say vegetables and fruits rather than fruits and veggies. Mm -hmm. But I'm absolutely not opposed to fruit. In fact, I feel like, I don't know, um, everybody's body is different in terms of how they respond to fruit. So you have to assess that for yourself. So are you overdoing it on fruit? Do you complement fruit with other things? Um, I usually like smaller fruits, like berries, because they tend to be more phytonutrient. Did you like them too, it looks like. <laughs> so, you know, to be thinking about variety of different fruits. But to bring in vegetables, and you know, my big thing is spices. I really do think spices and herbs are so important for diversity. You know, if you look at what we were up against as a hunter-gatherer society, thousands of years ago, we had access to about 3,000 different varieties of plants. That has gone down to 100 to 300. It's like, you know, several times down. So if it comes to fruit, just cycle through different ones. See how your body does respond to them. Uh, I wrote, I published an article on the colors of food, and I talk about how red foods are about inflammation, orange are about reproductive health, yellow is digestion, green is cardiovascular, Blue purple is brain. And so if you're missing one of the colors of fruits or vegetables, you're actually missing not antioxidants, but function. So fruits have function. In the, I love to see the cherries when I was here, because I've never seen a place where there's just so much focus on cherries. I'm like, there must be no inflammation here. <laughs> but um, I think variety is really important for that. Fantastic. I think in our last seven minutes here, um, you know, you know what I notice here, um, and I kind of just pick up on groups of people when I come and present and talk with you all. Um, there's something here about a tribe, a community. And so what I notice about people that get into dietary dogmas, like they, they go vegan, they go keto, they do whatever. 
it's like they so miss a tribe. Like they just want people that they can call friends and like have a support system and they don't want to have to like think and have to justify. So, and I think that this is, if you look at the nine factors of longevity through the Blue Zone, Stan Buechner's work, centenarians have a sense of tribe. You know, having your friends, having your neighbors, be, knowing these people because, you know, it, it's so important um, to have a healthy tribe. And if you move around a lot, it's sometimes it's hard to kind of create that. Second is be in touch with your emotions. So when I was a teenager, I was really rebellious. I was acting out in all kinds of ways. And I think it was because I felt really restricted and I was not in touch with emotions. And they weren't really well. I mean, eating was like a serious thing at our house. Like there was no laughing at the dinner table. Oh, I'm serious. Oh, so nobody else said that? <laughs> it was like, you know, if I didn't eat my dinner, I had to have it for breakfast. It was like, there was so much pathology around eating and it just created, like I would create all kinds of games at the dinner table with my sister. I'd try to make her laugh, like hitting her under the table. It's like I had to act out. I was not in touch with my emotions. And now one of the biggest things that I talk about with women, especially is emotional eating and how these cravings, you know, they're again, they're not against us. It's like our body's trying to tell us like something deeper is going on. Some emotion is not being expressed. We don't talk about emotions enough. We don't move through them, you know? And I think the biggest one is grief. Grief is a big one, sadness. Uh, I met a woman in Chicago. I was just giving a talk in Chicago before this. There's a woman there who does grief massage. I mean, you can imagine how much grief and how much gets stored within us in different parts. And body work is so important for that reason. Letting go of critical thoughts, like be your best friend. Like you are listening to you most of the time, right? Even in your sleep. So it's kind of like create a thought milieu that is non-inflammatory. Oh, let me just say one more thing about um, emotions. When I was growing up, I remember I was like, again, a sensitive kid and I would cry a lot and I'd be called crybaby. Um, you know, all this stuff about crying, stop crying. And then I started, when I was older, I was still a crybaby. I kept crying. <laughs> that's just a natural progression for me. But then I started to go into the research on crying. This is amazing. We have different types of tears. And in a person without any infection in their eyes, like a normal healthy person, without any outright inflammation, they have 25 different inflammatory cytokines in the tear fluid. I'm not kidding, 25 different ones. And when you cry because you're emotional about something or you have grief or loss, it's like these inflammatory cytokines change. And so it's so important to cry. Like you are, this is one of the ways that we cool off and that we exhibit anti-inflammatory activity is through release. And so letting yourself cry. And so I was so intrigued with crying and grief. Um, so I went and studied at the Grief Recovery Institute in California. They have a program for knowing how to help people with grief. And one of the thing is, like one of the first principles is do not shut down somebody's crying. Like you almost like you just witness. Like you don't go and hug them and like try to like quell it and stop it. You just like actually just let them get messy with tears. Like really let that person go with it. So I mentioned that and I belabor that because I know it's something that many people are uncomfortable with, and we do need to talk about it. It ties into eating otherwise. We start binging and doing other things if we're not able to release that. So you got this one. Oh, one, one fun thing you can do here is get a pack of um, like sticky notes, post-it notes, time yourself on a smartphone for five minutes, and write down one thought per post-it note. Bless you. And just keep doing it over and over, like for five minutes, and just see what thoughts, like actually read your thoughts. And then when you're done, just put them all out. I've done this in groups before, where we do this and everybody puts their thoughts up on a wall. It's so amazing how many similar thoughts people are having. Right. And how many, negative thoughts people are having and how we are constantly feeding ourselves with those negative thoughts, just like we would with a meal that would be inflammatory. So move your body and sweat, that's another thing. Um, I like to be in nature, I don't, I'm not a gym person, I can't stand gyms, but I do like to be in nature and I don't feel like I've satisfied being outside unless I've had a sweat. <laughs> I've gotta break a sweat, I mean you gotta flow and one of the reasons to flow through sweat is because you release toxins through your sweat. In fact, better than you do through blood or urine. You release more toxins like heavy metals through your sweat. So do most of you have saunas here? I know Michelle does, the Newtons. You have a sauna, right? Yeah. 
So it's just, you need to get a little bit of sweat. You need to get things moving through. Uh, number five, do less of what drains you and more of what inspires you. That sounds so easy, but it's not. So one thing you can do to figure out what inspires you is have a piece of paper and then on one side plus and just write down all the things that really inspire you. Time yourself for about three minutes on the other side, write down all the things that really take your energy. And it could be small things. It could be like being in traffic. It could be, I don't know, just it could be in-laws. It could be certain people, whatever it is. But try to figure out the length of your list. It's really interesting to me because I have found when I do this in workshops, People who are older, in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, actually are doing more of the things that inspire them and less of the things that drain them. Whereas the young people, like when I start doing this with 20 and 30 year olds, they have a long list of things that drain them and a short list of what inspires them, which feels really interesting. And I've seen that pretty consistently. And I think most of all, get your rest, get your silence, you know, whatever that means for you. Get your alone time. That's so important for creating that inner reset. And I, um, I've studied with various teachers, and so I have a little place in my house where I do set up candles. I set up candles. I have like my little ancestor place. I have a little another place of focusing on intentions. So I have candles to really connect you into the fire that is healing and sacred. So um, just summarizing each of these, and maybe in close, anything there that kind of speaks to you terms of what your takeaway would be. Anybody just want to raise their hand and just say something about something on lifestyle now that you feel like you could do. Yes. I just I love I feel like so much of our daily life doesn't give us like we perceive there's no permission to do the things that we enjoy and inspire us. So there's yes. all these regulations in ourselves and around us. And so finding the way to sort of explicitly figure out Perfect. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's so you're really tapping into uh, number five, right? And so trying to find the refuge, like one little thing that really inspires you, kind of really connecting into that. Okay. Great. Yes. On that note, um, I brought my knitting today. You brought your knitting. And oh, great. And I can listen and do it at the same time. That's wonderful. What a great idea. You just showed us how we could do number five. <laughs> Roger. Yeah, um, to help uh, stress and do separate Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. You yourself. That's why I told you yesterday that the Don't do so fast. Yeah. Enjoy your presentation. Taste your food, enjoy it. Yeah. Be centered before you put some on Yeah. Because I, I see people who are obese that just don't even taste the food and they're shoveling. And people who are thin doing that too. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody is kind of in that epidemic. You don't talk to anybody. You don't make it a social engagement. Right. Yeah. Enjoy the food. Yeah. Make it a special time. Make it a special yeah. time. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not something. Yeah, so slowing down. Yeah, we went to a farm, the Loma Farm dinner the other night where Logan and his mom and everybody was creating a beautiful meal for us. And uh, what Roger was speaking to was somebody uh, mentioned to him to slow down his chewing. Like it really paid. I love that actually when people call me out on things because it's like, oh, I yeah, I think that's awesome. And, and even. The rest of the meal, even more. And enjoy the, the meal even more. And one of the things, because I do yoga, that I'm really keyed into is chewing, yes, but body posture. And most people, when they're eating, they're like this. You know, they're like hunched over, posture is bad, digestion is poor, they're constricting their legs and blood flow. So how is like, how are they ever going to make any good decisions based on not having like full body? You talk about centeredness, and that kind of brought that to mind for me. So yeah, um, and for that reason, I made a card deck, you know, to like slow people down and like pick a card with a meal and it's be inspired with something about that meal. Wonderful. Well, we did our takeaways. So um, thank you so much. This has been, I, I want to thank the Newtons for this invitation. I want to thank Paula uh, and the whole Groundwork team because it's been phenomenal. Um, 
I was texting my husband like, I think we need to move to Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> 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 